All right. Welcome, everybody, to the weekly Probate Master Group coaching call, the Estate Professionals Mastermind podcast. I want to get started off this week with an announcement. We just yesterday released our first ever third party course. I have a big ambition to help everybody here work less, earn more, and do good. And I don't always have the time to create all the courses I wish I could get out of my head. One of those is actually that step by step how to actually get to accredited investor status, where you hear us talk about syndication and some of the more or unavailable alternative investments. So my friend, Aaron Velke, uh, who's a fellow mastermind member, and he's a real estate investor. He's, you know, achieved financial independence in his thirties. They, he's got an eight year head start. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we collaboratively released his course map, mapping your first million. It's not part of the probate mastery assets. It's under Magnum Opus project, the bigger company that also holds probate mastery. We've got people at all levels of their journey here in, into real estate and wealth creation. We, we have fun talking about the accredited investments and the, the more sophisticated things, but I felt like I need to have some offering for people who are just getting started in that journey. Unfortunately, Aaron couldn't be here today. He's got some live engagements that he's he's hosting, but that course is available now. And it's something that I'm, I'm happy to actually get out to you guys. Because if you find yourself in a position where you feel like that's an unreachable step, like just getting a real estate business off the ground, this could be a good course for you. The other thing that we, so I want to address coaching. What I will say is whatever coaching you guys think you need, if you need, if you want additional help, if you want more attention, if you want more accountability, we're looking to design the product for you or the service for you. So if you could share your input to support at probatemastery.com or in the chat, in the social post, wherever, just however you can get that to us. If you have a need for a higher level of attention and you want to work with a, a proven coach, just let us know what that is. Uh, Ryan, you're patiently waiting. You're up first today. How can I help? How's it going, Chad? How you doing? I'm doing all right. So I have a question about properties where I can't get in touch with anybody basically like friends of mine who know I'm like learning about probate now are coming to me and being like, Hey, like I have this property that's vacant. I've looked into it. There's, there's nobody I can call. I've called everybody who is available and either nobody's answering or nobody's, or there's nobody to call. What is a next step that I could take towards? These, these are probate houses or you're just talking vacant houses? Yeah, they're, they're probate. There's a few different situations, but a few of them, like both owners are deceased, you no know, close relatives. So you're the, the source of the, the deal or the, the perspective deal would be driving for dollars or just being aware of a vacant house, knowing that a death occurred, not necessarily on a probate list. Right? One of them I know for a fact is in probate. Yeah. I did just check. Okay. Then in that case, you know who to call. Because... Right. That's a, yeah, that's a different situation. Yeah. Okay. So on, on the vacant houses, and this is really across all vacant houses, I've found the easiest way is to just close your laptop and get in the truck and just drive to the, or, or is it in your market? You yeah, know? it was, I went in the house and I think there was a squatter in there. It's a hoarder house. It was disgusting. It was yeah. actually vile, but there was like running water upstairs. Somebody was in there. What I've found to be most uh, efficient in doing this detective work is just talking to neighbors. I'll typically start by knocking on the doors and being like, hey, listen, a friend of mine just told me to check this out and see if I could help this family. Who, who owns that? When's the last time you saw them? How often are they here? Who's getting the mail? And just start asking questions. Neighbors usually know. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes communities are, they don't, like people don't know each other exist, but a lot of times you'll get the whole story. Even when properties are vacant, there's usually somebody from the family that's in town, but they might be estranged and they, not, they may not even care that that person's gone, but they'll be in the line of succession. So they have an incentive to file probate so you can make them an offer. But that's how I've had the most success. There's obviously skip tracing services. You can look at the names on title and then use something like Spokio or Intellius or one of the other million tools to try to find known family members and then try to call them a lot of work. If it's a really big deal and one that you really want to get, there are private investigators that actually will do a full investigation to find all of the people in the line of succession and track them down for you. But you're going to pay for a service like that. Look at the probate records in your town. And then next would be try to talk to neighbors and get direct phone numbers from neighbors. I have also done things like I've taped pieces of paper inside of a storm door so it can be seen from the road. People who are familiar with the property will oftentimes just drive by. They know they know it's a mess inside. They don't need to go inside, but they still drive by or, or some one drives by and checks on it for them. I've actually done this effectively before tax sales too. 
what I'll do is just, just write a letter. I'll take the letter that I would normally mail and I'll put four pieces of tape on it and tape it inside of a window. If there's a storm door, it's ideal because then it's, it's behind glass and it'll last quite a while. Eventually the sun wrinkles it and it starts to break down and looks like crap, but you can do that. Other ideas are door hangers. Like you can put something in a plastic bag and, and hang a lot on, on the doorknob where it's visible from the street. So it looks like somebody needs to pick up the mail with squatters living there. Neither of those might be great ideas, but it, it could work. The other thing is potentially talking to local law enforcement. So I've done well, like talking to police officers. They know that neighborhood. They spend 40 hours a week in that, in that range, whatever their, their beat is. You can learn a lot from the sheriff's department. They usually know the stories of all those houses. Oh, that's where the so-and-so lived. His son went to jail and they can give you a lot of background information on the asset itself that might not necessarily necessarily get you in touch with the owners, but we'll give you leads on how you can find the right people who you're looking for. So that's just a, a few ideas. Those are the things I've used successfully in the past. I mean, one, one of them in particular, I dug for a deed and just any information. And there wasn't anything except for a notice of default from like 1989. And the house has been vacant for 10 years now. It's like a ghost property. I called the city and they're like, we have no idea. Like so you, you have, have a title any record? There's no record of deed. I had the city dig for it and they were baffled that they couldn't find it. Did you ask them what the process is? Has that ever happened and how was it dealt with? What their process for looking for the deed is? We're getting a title on a piece of real property. They're not being paid taxes on. Why have they not recovered the asset? Right. Yeah. I don't know. That's a, it's a perfect situation for adverse possession. So it's how long has it been vacant and can you step in and, and qualify for adverse possession and get a free house? Yeah, I think adverse possession in Massachusetts is 20 years. So I don't think it, it was definitely lived in in like 2013 because on Google, the picture was like a well-kept house. Yeah, but they're not receiving tax revenue because they're not sending a tax bill because there's no title. Now, the lady said there was like 100000 in taxes on this place. I don't think it's been paid in 30 or 40 years. How can there be a tax card without title though? I don't know. They told us that there was a hundred thousand due on this property, okay. but I don't know. So they have a hundred thousand dollars worth of incentive to help you through this process. I would go back and ask to meet with the clerk, not one of the clerks, but the elected county clerk. And I, I would just say, listen, I, I've looked at, and you should beforehand see what you can find out. If you have a real estate attorney that's doing work for you, ask him, like, what happens when you have a house with no title and, and by state law? But potentially, they should be incentivized to help help you through that process if you're willing to bring the taxes current. Is it worth a hundred grand? Oh, yeah. Probably bare minimum, just as a teardown, probably the lot is like 200. So the worst case scenario here is, is they won't give you as, as an individual, they won't give you the, the sole opportunity to buy the tax deed. Are you tax deed or tax lien state? Tax lien. Okay. So what's your redemption period? One year or two? I think it's less. I think it's like six. Okay. Your worst case scenario here could be you have to bid against others at the tax lien auction. If they take it to auction versus letting you just buy the tax lien outright. I would make them an offer. I'm like, listen, you don't even have a title for this. I don't know how the tax card's connected. This is obviously an outlier. So how about I give you a thousand bucks for the tax lien and we'll wait through the six month redemption period. And if it's not redeemed, then I'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars in taxes. You produce a deed and, a, and a, a tax ID and my company name, and we'll move forward. It's worth a shot. Like if, if this is, who knows, it's probably happened before, but who knows how long it's been. I've never found one that like didn't have a deed. That's, that's interesting. I've, I've found stuff without deeds recorded. They still had a tax ID and, and had an old, old, old deed wet years and years and years ago. That wasn't even the, the current owner, but Dave Gwen said, can you reach out to the lien holder from last year? I don't, I don't think they've taken it out to, to a tax auction. It sounds like they've let it, they've let back taxes accumulate for 40 years without putting it on the auction. So anyway, that's what I would try. I would educate myself as much as I can talk to a, a Massachusetts real estate attorney. And then I would approach the clerk and say, listen, I, I want to buy this. So let's, let's start by how do I buy the tax lien from you today? And then during that redemption period, if nobody steps forward and, and redeems, then be there to buy it in six months. Gotcha. Thanks. Awesome, man. So you're just getting into this. You're uncovering deals already. That's great. Trying. Yeah. You have your hand up. You're next. 
My name is David Young, Chad. Yeah, I just joined the group probably about, I think about three weeks ago. I'm here in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I have a, a quick question for you. Yeah, how can I help? But yeah, I reached out to a person in probate. I started reaching out to her around March, and she finally sent me a message back last week and said she wanted to go ahead and sell the property. So I looked up the property address, and it said pre-foreclosure. So what I'm asking, is it too late for them to save the property, or is it too late since the property is already in pre-foreclosure? It's not too late. It, do you know if it's a reverse mortgage or a conventional? What kind of loan type it is? They owe $100,000 on the house. They have $170,000 equity. Okay, so it's a first position mortgage, like not a HELOC or a reverse. Right. Okay. Can anyone in the family afford to bring the note current? Nope, they can't afford it. Uh, you think it might be like a substitute type situation? Yeah, well, I can probably just pay up the mortgage and take over the property and probably put it back on market after I pay exactly. the, so, the pre-foreclosure. You're saying probate is open and they have the letters? No, they, they, she have to file probate. Okay, that's step one. And like today, like you've got about you know, 30, 33 more minutes to go get that done. I would recommend filing probate today, like petition today. You might have a week or so delay and getting them appointed and getting the letters. At that point, they can sign on authorization to release, or they can contact the lender themselves and you need a payoff statement and see what that loan payoff is. The other thing you need to know is, is there a sale scheduled? Where are they in the process? So typically it's 30 day, 60 day, 90 day late. Then you initiate the process and it's typically at 120 days or more is, is that foreclosure process. Get them authority first, then figure out where they are in the timeline, then get a payoff amount, what it's going to take to, to bring the loan current and to pay it off. And then you, then you have choices. So then you can choose whether you make them a cash offer and just pay the note off. Or if that doesn't make any sense, how much do they need to walk away with, if anything? And then how much does it cost you to bring it current? And what I would recommend in that case, if you buy that one sub two, that's already in this stage, I recommend rolling it into a land trust. So it looks like a death occurred and it was rolled into a family estate plan. So get the authorization to release once they have the authority. If you buy it sub two, make sure you've got that document from the note holder authorizing you to talk directly to the lender on their behalf. And then that way you can set up auto service and you can set up a third party servicer where the payments auto drafted from your bank account hits their bank account. You both get email and, and mail receipts. And that way it looks like a, a state planning, but that's the, the order of what you need to do next. First and foremost, get them into probate. So they have authority to have the conversation with the lender. Okay. I got you. Yeah, what, what I do know is all, only thing they do want is $5,000 just to walk away from the house, five okay. grand. And do you know how far, what the, uh, it takes to bring it current? Do you already know that? I don't know the price to bring it current. They trying to find that out now because the mortgage company won't talk to her because they have to file the, uh, probate first. So the mortgage company not talking to her to let her know how much is actually to bring the, the property up to current payment. Do you know when they stop making payments? I have no idea. Okay. You can usually back into it and figure out a ballpark, but that's, that's good to know. So you just need to make them an offer that's five grand over payoff. And so yep. if the bank is aggressive and they're only 90 days behind, hell, you might be buying this house for 10 grand. Alex, Terry, whoever, whoever wants to go. Hi, Chad, Terry, Shell here in Houston, Texas. First hey, time member of the uh, mastermind group. I and saw I your am, post this morning. It sounds like you're aggressively jumping into this. Good I got you. that three foot flame under my rear end and it's just driving me nuts night and day. I got the course on the on demand course on Saturday afternoon and I worked all day Sunday and Monday. I uh, added my marshal at a private golf club here in Houston, which is unveiling, unraveling all kinds of leads for probate attorneys and I've got people with money to put behind. It's incredible, but I, I, I don't know if I'm being premature, but I have just one part left of the third session, take the last certification quiz to get certified today. I'm going to be finishing that. And, uh, you talk about the presentation package in one of your modules and I've gone through it and I've gotten, I have all the notes on what should be included. My question is, is there an example presentation package that I can look at from you? So in that session three in the course downloads, you may have missed it. There's actually a link. It's an actual appointment package. And as I say in those sessions, it's, it's incredibly simple for a reason. I found that the more polished my packages were, the less attention they paid to me. So I really, really dumbed them down and made them almost laughable. So that's by design. I'd rather have them focused on me than on my marketing collateral. I like that. I like that. I am not a realtor. 
I've been investing in real estate on and off for over 45 years, however, and I've gotten, I have a good handle on creative financing and all of its different shapes and sizes. But would you suggest that I, not being a realtor, would vary my marketing to people differently than what your, oh, your, your, your slant is mostly toward realtors, I think? My personal, like the way I handle it and the reason I cross train here in this community is it's 60% brokerage, 40% investment or acquisition. So you, you're possibly leaving uh, high six figures of money on the table each year. You're already talking to these folks. Why not challenge yourself to be able to monetize everything? real estate conversation. Usually as a licensee, you're held to to ethical standards and a higher level of professionalism. You have something more to lose. So you can actually compete against other investors by being licensed. It gives you a bit of an edge. And it doesn't mean you have to jump into the mainstream of conventional real estate and have your face on billboards and shopping carts. Like I would recommend for somebody like you that's got a lot of experience, especially in the creative financing space, Either find a, a broker who's just a broker for himself and does similar types of deals, or maybe approach a commercial brokerage. If you're not looking for a conventional career in real estate, try to hang with a non-MLS broker so you don't have to pay all those fees and, and everything. So just hang it as referral only with a non-MLS bro or, or with a non-MLS broker or with a commercial firm. And I think you'll do well in a commercial firm. That's, that's probably my, my top recommendation for you is meet with some commercial brokers and say, Hey, listen, I'm in the residential space, but on the investment side of that, and then you're basically going to use it as a referral license. Like it, we're not going to try to make you go become, you know, a listing agent and get signs and figure out marketing packages and all that. If you're not interested in that, do it on a, a referral basis. You can still make 50% of the commission because you're literally handing them the listing on a silver platter. I had at one time, since he's changed directions, been the assistant to a commercial broker here in Houston. And I did that for the reason that I wanted to have access to the MLS for market uh, comparative analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And he's now moved on and dropped his membership, but that wouldn't fit in the same wheels you're talking about. The, the thing there is you're going to have to pay national and local dues. So it's going to drive your cost way up. And if you're not actually not trying to be a residential realtor, if you just look for somewhere to put your license, most commercial brokers are not members of the MLS because they're dealing in assets that don't, don't make a whole lot of sense on MLS. So they're not paying the fees. All the state needs to know is that a broker is responsible for you and that your referral commissions are coming through them and you're not actively acting as a fiduciary. So it's, it's a, for just the continuing education requirements and the fee that you pay the state for a few hundred dollars a year, you can have a few hundred thousand dollars a year in income potential off referrals. Great. My approach is that with the connections I have, I'm going to be approaching and meeting with probate attorneys and financial planners and the like, and I have a ton of connections with them using your lead about how I can help them with do their job, the services I provide, linear suite of services, vertical uh, suite of services, is that's still a, to me, a very good direction to head into this. Do you, would you agree with that? Yeah, you definitely need to be a hundred percent clear on your offer and proud of it before you approach the attorneys. But I want you to think about more than, Hey, let me tell you how great my business is. I want you to be thinking about, okay, what can I say to this attorney that will help them quickly see I'm here to scale their firm and mine in, in exchange or in reciprocity, but you want to be really, really focused on what's in it for them. So how can I help your law firm be more efficient and scale up? Have you heard the idea discussed of walking in the door with a referral? especially with your side gig working on a golf course statistics will tell you that 95 percent of those guys teeing off every morning don't have an estate plan and I, hell i have friends in their 40s dying of heart attack and so you never know so most americans aren't prepared and will go through probate so what a great way to generate referrals on the golf course to help them get prepared for what's inevitable and then walk them straight to the attorney that you're looking to get to know and say, listen, I've got a high net worth individual who just said that he wanted an hour of time with my attorney that I offered him. And I'm looking for the right attorney that I know can act as a fiduciary for my clients because that's of utmost importance to me. And you're talking their language. I like that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for your time. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for being here. It's nice to have you as part of the community, Terry.
always Thank like you. to have that much experience come in. You can teach us all something. Thank you, sir. All right, Alex, you figured out the hand raise. Sorry, we skipped you, man. No, that's okay. <clears throat> I just had a just a small little victory. I finally got my bought my LLC and domain name. As you were talking about domain names uh, last week, so I like made sure I got mine locked in place. I'm also here in Houston. You know, Terry, it's called the good, the bad, and the ugly home buyers. And, and also, I really don't have that much stuff to. I know I really don't have that much stuff to talk to about on, on probate here. I've still got the anxiety of picking up the phones, especially when I'm kind of having a hard time of uh, helping my own family go through their situation here. But uh, I think it was David Purnell or, or somebody said, just you know, don't spend too much time on on just one family. If they're being difficult, move on to the next one. And that's, that's what I'm doing. Just wanted to share that out there with, with y'all real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Good job with the domain. You and Terry should should try to, to link up. Like he's aggressively stepping into this space based on some of the things you said. You've got some limiting beliefs you need to work through. It might be good to buy him a beer or, or play around the golf with him. What your family is going through, like you can pull from that story. That's part of your empathy statement, right? Trust me, I know what you're going through. I won't lie, like I'm well versed in this, and even my family's struggling with it. So it, it's a powerful empathy statement that will help them go, oh, okay, so he's not just saying he's an expert, he's actually been through this or is going through this. So you should be able to pull confidence from that because you can say, listen, I, I'm calling because I've got a team of people here locally that help families going through probate. The reason for that is I saw how hard it was for my family and I stepped up to do something. So I just wanted to call today to let you know that there is a, a service in the community and just to learn a little bit about your situation to see if there's any way I can help you not feel like my family did for the last six months. What's, uh, what's one thing you'd like to delegate if you could, like just say, huh, not mine. Awesome. So awesome. Got this recording, you can come back to it. But I would encourage you to spend some time with Terry and absorb some of that energy he's putting off over there. You're right there. I left my uh, name and phone number and email address in the chat box for Alex. I don't, I don't know if you've got it, Alex. But I'd oh. like to get together with you. Okay, will do. Thank you, Chad. Yes. And Terry, uh, Kevin had said uh, Stepstone Realty is a broker in, in Texas. They're in Austin, not Houston, but they are focused on investor agents. So if you didn't see that comment, Sherry's in Houston too. We've got a lot of Houstonites here today. All right. Tony, you're up next. How can we help you? Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Hey, I have a question for you. We just onboarded, I just onboarded my team to start doing probate to go after uh, personal rep representatives. We just got our data from probate leads. My question to you is, do you already, do you already have any pre-made scripts that we could piggyback or use as like a base? Yeah. yeah. So it's a common question. One that I have, I'll stay off my soapbox. Everybody's smiling at me. Like oh, we just walked into a trap. What we teach in session three is, I mean, we spend almost three hours breaking down that initial conversation. And what I give you is a conversation framework, like a worksheet that you fill out as you're having a conversation. So I don't ever provide a script book where it says, use these words. There are members, David Pinnell's here, he and Randy Milmeister, they have actually scripted, made script books out of the transcriptions from all the calls that I've done in the past. But between session three of the course you bought, and you can connect with Randy Milmeister, David Pinnell, a couple of others in this group that have actually scripted the hundreds and hundreds of hours of the calls that I've offered. But the reason we don't offer scripts is it's just so, there's so many variables in this, especially when you're providing investment services, brokerage services, non-real estate services, and we're providing literally a dozen different marketing hooks. The conversation can go anywhere in the first few seconds. So for me, when I sat down to try to learn to convey this to others, I, I had scripts in the very beginning and people just fell on their face and they quit in a hurry. So for me, pulling the script book away was the way that I could keep people engaged longer to, to fail forward and stick with it and develop their own language. That's the reason it's not the easiest thing to, I, I could say, go download this, but that's the reasoning behind it. But it, are your, is your team taking the course or is it one person or is everybody like, what's the approach? Yeah. I've been sharing with them some of the material that I got from the course and I'm really just training one other agent right now. So he's going to be doing the campaign with me. So for right now, it's just me and another agent and we have another agent here that's going to be onboarding with us and also doing the same campaign, going after the personal representative to develop the relationship. We set up the vendor uh, team. We've reached out to several people in our local market that offer the different services that we could refer to yeah. the personal representatives. Another question, I think you said that you offer custom-made website. We can get through you. 
like a, a website representing us and what we're doing? Yeah. So that was when I was on the All the Leads channel. They provide WordPress websites. It's about I think if, I think their pricing still the same. It's 199 and set up, and then 39 dollars a month. Now, just to be clear, that's a credibility website. It's it's not going to rank because there's lots and lots of versions of it. So it's not a conversion website. It's not a lead website. It's a credibility website. So it's somewhere to, for people to go to go, oh, okay, he's professional enough. He has a website and it looks like he knows what he's talking about. And then if you want to longer term, if this is a campaign that, that's working for you, what I would suggest is like David Pinnell is heavily investing in his long-term website, which is an inbound marketing strategy. So he's done a lot of aggressive blogging, like getting the content laid down in his market. So Longer term, I would recommend you build your own and, and start writing hyper-local content because then you own it. But that website, it's a good place to start. It's, it's a digital business card. When they want to see, just verify if you're full of it or not. It, it gives you a presence that most people don't have, and it can be done in a week. Yeah, and try not to use probate in your website URL, okay? That's yeah. for attorneys, not for us. We haven't let you stand up on the pedestal and brag for a while, man. Cut loose. Uh, I have that flip that I bought in January. It's closing and the comps went up 50 grand in the time that I took me to remodel it. So I've got a large tax bill this month. Yeah. You need to call me on that, man. I'll show you how to eliminate that through putting like investment. So show of hands who on this call wishes they had a $94,000 closing check this month. Yeah. And how many of you guys are actually making offers to sellers as well as talking to them about listing? Is everybody comfortable making an offer? Yeah. All right. Cool. Cause this is what can happen. Like I've never had one hit that big. I think 56,000 was my biggest. I well, saw them at 117 and I, it went for 56 more the day of like, just literally just cleaned it out, turned around and flipped the paper. And he walked away from the closing table with a check cause he was using a, a debt coverage loan for the community bank. Well, that's great. Thanks for sharing Dave. I haven't asked you in a while. What percentage of your activity or your closings or revenue now is from brokerage versus investment? I would say almost 90% from investment now. It's crazy. I don't know. I'm glad that I hit this when I did and it's converting to completely investment. I don't even try to get listings anymore. So ultimately, do you see yourself just referring the listings off though? No, because they're so easy. I have a TC that does the listings and a sign guy. So at this point, it's just representing the client. If they want to do the listing, I'll do it. But yeah, uh, we're targeting the pre-probate, if you want to call it, the distressed properties and foreclosures. This month alone in Texas and Fort Worth, there's 400 foreclosures. Wow. In the last seven days, it's back. Our business is going to be back. We're, we're going to be hiring callers again. We've been buying them since January. And the probate too. Probate's back. Do you buy your foreclosure through Rowdy's? We, from a source. I know it's everything goes through the Rowdy report. Yeah, it's two weeks ahead of any anyone else. Yeah. We're getting foreclosures all the way for end of June right now. We got a 360 listing and then a burnt house. We got a burnt house for a fifth of the cost and we're going to sell just the land for 150. So we got it for 75. Yeah. I've had, I've had good luck with burn houses too. So when I first got started in investing, I had a Google alert for fire Roanoke, Virginia. And literally every, every time I kept a spreadsheet of every house that was in the newspaper or on the local news channel. I would actually document the homes that caught on fire because usually in 60 days or so they get an insurance check and they're like, whatever, just give me whatever, you know, little amount. And you can get some really good deals on those. Yep. Yeah. It's completely converting my business. So three years ago I was going, I had 40 signs that I ordered and I was thinking I was going to do 50, 50, but I don't even look for listings anymore. Buyers. I guess so many people register on my website for buyers. I don't even respond to them. Yeah. It's crazy. I need to refer them out, but how do you refer a deal where somebody can't get a house and they're competing against 20 other offers? Yeah. You might talk to call a referral exchange and ask for Lisa, tell her I recommended it, but they have 50 state licensed trained callers that will just hammer, hammer that database until it qualifies. Their deal is they'll find an agent that wants to work it and they'll take a 10% spread. So you pay a 30% referral fee. Uh, I think the other agent gets 20 and then the referral exchange keeps 10, but that might be a way to monetize the ones you're leaving sitting. I don't know who asked about the scripting. It's a different conversation with these probate people as Chad has taught, but you have three people that normally run the probate. You have the spouse that lost a spouse. Unfortunately, that's not a good phone call. But you have family members that extend the family members in the local area that are dealing with the probate. 
they're getting hammered by local investors. So they're not ready to really talk to you until the second month. And then you have extended family out of state. And that's the ones that we look for in the data. So anybody buying data that really wants to hammer it, look for your out of state people. And then if you want to put a cherry on top, look at, look at the administrators, the bonded and unbonded administrators, not the executors. And then work your way through the data that way. You're going to have more success breaking down to out-of-state people and then administrators of the estate, not the executors. Alex, I think that's a really good suggestion for you in particular, based on what you said earlier, like you've got call reluctance and you're nervous. So what David's suggesting is start with the least emotionally sensitive and go toward the most emotional. But if you have someone who's labeled as an administrator, then you know that there is no will and that, that they were appointed. But if they're out of town and they're an administrator, not an executor or executrix, then it's not going to be as an emotional of a conversation or decision. So you've got less of a risk of getting snapped at or hitting hard objections on the phone. So you might want to start prioritizing your list that way until you actually get rid of that. Some of those limiting beliefs where you, you proudly approach them all. And with the surviving spouse, we haven't talked a whole lot about that lately, but it, it is a it is a different approach, but I would tell you guys that when a surviving spouse needs your help, you can literally provide life-changing results in a matter of days or hours. So don't, don't completely shy away from talking to surviving spouses because oftentimes their income has been cut in half, their expenses have remained the same or gone up, and they're just in this tailspin and they've lost their identity. They're trying to figure out what that is. And sometimes that results in foreclosure situations and people falling and getting hurt. They can't keep up with the maintenance of the house and it can spiral out of control really quickly. And a lot of times ends in depression and even worse. Eventually you'll have the stories like we have. Drusilla is the one I always point to because I look at her couch every day. She sold me the leather couch, but uh, this was a 53 year old woman who had been stuck in probate quicksand for two years. She had all the curtains pulled, didn't leave her house, was in a deep, dark depression and I literally in, in seconds, you could see the change created. Like she changed, she opened up her posture and this little 53 year old woman emptied out like over a 3000 square foot house in two days. It was on the market day three. We had it, we found a cash buyer, closed it probably inside of two weeks, I think. And then she moved to North Carolina to be with her granddaughter, her new baby granddaughter and her help her daughter. So like it, it had, I not called and it was obvious she was a surviving spouse the decedent's name matched the the, the person the executrix name but she just wasn't doing anything and it was amazing to see the impact that just one conversation could have it broke her out of two years of absolute misery so i, I don't want you to take this as call those out of states and then call the in towns and leave the spouses alone because when you do help them it makes one hell of a difference in, in their outcome next up mike haven't seen you in a while Welcome back. Oh, oh, there we go. I'm meant to do that. Sorry. So my question is about the, the URL. So I've had Sacramento, what is it? Sacramento probate agent for years. And you're saying that that's not a good one to have because it has the word probate in it. David, I'm going to let you take it. You oh, get it's just, I'm getting away from using the word probate in anything I do in probate because I'm not the attorney. And if you say probate, they're going to automatically put that keyword subconsciously to the process of probate and they're going to shut you down. So you, but when you say they're going to shut you down, who, like, who's going to shut you down? Like the, like I'm going to, it's going to affect me when I'm on, like up on the, on Google on searches and things like that, or is it going to, I'm sorry, I'm working here, but it's, it, it's not a proven point yet. What I'm trying to say is I just don't want to use the word probate to keyword because people that are looking for probate, they're looking for an attorney. So they're not ready yet to talk to you. Man, I'm sorry. Let me get my headphones. So Mike, it, it, it's sometimes like, so what he's saying is that like you, through association with the word probate, they may be apprehensive to have the conversation with you. I, like the other reason is it's not like when you, if you're going to invest heavily in a brand like that, you got to think how quickly can I grow out of it? When I meet an elder care attorney at one of them. See, that's the thing I have. I have another site that's called Sierra Home Transitions. That's the one I use when I'm dealing with care, elder people that are moving their parents into an elderly care community. So yeah. that's, that is marketed for that. This one is just strictly, just strictly probate. That's all I use that site. As a matter of fact, it's all the leads thing. It's, it's just that information site. 
It sounds like you're capable of managing multiple brands. I don't recommend it for most people because it gets out of hand quickly. The, the one thing I would say about in your market, because you're in, you're in one of those, the, the most unique area in the country where most people do have a living trust, like having probate in your brand, in your domain could actually make, give you the opposite result. When someone in trust administration sees that they're like, oh, this guy deals with probate. We avoided that. I like the transition brand a lot better because it fits elder care, it fits probate, it fits trust administration, hell, it even fits divorce and guardianship. So you can fit so much more into that brand and you won't turn away, as David cautioned, people who have a negative association already with the word probate, but you also won't turn away people who identify as the beneficiary of a living trust. So I have thought of this, and I'm not a website guy. All my business is basically direct mail and some pay-per-click. And I don't like to have lots of sites all over the place. So I, I thought of maybe taking the Sierra Home Transitions and just having like a tab on it that says probate and using that for everything. That's do you think I that would, would be a better idea? I do. And it's, it's a lot of people don't think of like, if we start building a house, you dig a hole and put some concrete in it and then start putting framing on top of it. It's obvious you're building an asset. And I think a lot of people jump into websites and the digital assets, forgetting that, Hey, the, the more deliberate I am about building this as a digital asset, the more marketable it will be when I'm done with it, it will be a sellable asset. So a lot of my advice around websites, it comes from, it's a longer term mindset on it like if that's a really powerful domain if you put strong cash flow and a book of business behind it and you, the main thing that you can sell would be the vendor team that you've built the model and and the referral network that comes with it your book of business and probate isn't that valuable for that long it's a couple of years so it's not you're not going to sell it as you would like a commercial real estate brokerage but that can be a very sellable asset so all that said, the, the focus on one brand is what I would recommend. So even if you end up doing divorce, guardianship, elder care, you know, you name it, senior relocation, senior vacation homes, whatever that specialty might be, funnel all that effort, all that SEO, all of that domain authority, try to point it toward one digital asset. And then that way that that can be part of your retirement plan. Whenever the next person's ready to take over your position as the authority, You've already built the community. You've built the, the, the authority and you own that spot and they'll pay you for it. Yeah, you don't I don't plan on retiring. I'm, I'm going to work till I'm a hundred, but, uh, but that would, that is good. That's, I appreciate that, that information. Thank you very much. Year four or five, you're going to be in a position where I'm at at a turning point where you are making money doing this. And we just went on a two and a half week vacation. I didn't miss a beat. That's, yeah, you don't it, want it. You don't want everything in your name. You don't want. It to be so, you want it to be scalable and automatable so that if someone, the perspective of someone, when they call you, our goal is to get the listing or to buy the property. You don't want to be, we buy houses guy either. You want to be, I want to be Dave Pinnell and I want to have YouTube testimonials about how I closed on their property on Facebook. I want to show houses that I'm closing on that are trashy, but also keep my brand awareness where I still do luxury listings if I get them if I want them, but I don't yeah. want, to, I don't want to be the guy with 25 websites. I want to have cities, real estate.com. And then I want to have 156 blog articles that direct that traffic to a registration page. Or if I call them on the phone and send an appointment, they're going to look up my name and see houses we're flipping. And they're going to say, all right, this guy has the money to buy my house or he has the knowledge I need to get from what do I do with this property that is in this condition? What do I do with this house? All the houses I bought, people just wanted to know that I could buy the house or help them through the situation, the problem. They didn't care if I knew. I, I don't know anything about probate. I don't know a dang thing about probate, man, other than what Chad's taught me. I bought 22 books and they all just talk about executors and administrators and <laughs> all the crap you need for the probate. But I don't think I've ever helped a person through probate. But I have closed 110 properties with probate. You know, take that for a grain of salt, man. You don't need to have a website that says everything about probate. You need successful stories, testimonials. And when they're at the closing table, get a video of them talking about you and get a writer to write that content from that video like Chad does with probate. But use the word estate, use the word help, 
get away from being like everybody else on a surface level basis. Yep. We're a bunch of nonconformists here. Thanks. Thanks for your input day. Renee, what do you got for us this week? Thank you. Hi guys. No, I was just going to share a couple things around persistence and consistency, even though we can never drill that home enough is I've been following up with this lady for over a year, probably a year. And I believe she was going to be the executor. And then the short story was there was too much infighting. So it went to a fiduciary, but she remembered me and she gave the fiduciary my number. This lady was out of state. The house is in Los Angeles and the fiduciary is in Los Angeles. And it's a potential $4 million teardown in the Pacific Palisades. Uh And I don't work that price point here. But what I did is I know a lot of agents And if you guys even watch TV, it doesn't matter, but one of the Fufu agencies around here is called The Agency, and that's all they do is work high-end. So I got a buddy that works over there and um, hitched my wagon to his wheel. So there's a whole lot of hoops to jump through. I don't know, as Chris Voss says, you're either the fool or the favorite in the deal. So I don't know, we may be the fool. She might have her favorites, but I I am going to take this on, and we made it through the second rung. And so now the second rung is go over, take a look, and then propose what you think the house is valued at. So I am going to jump through those hoops just to learn. But it's the point is that it's stay consistent, stay upbeat, be caring, like all of your messages. And I'm sure everyone on this call is because you never know that came out of left field. Like that was a dead lead, to be honest with you. And now at least it's a potential. Always remain friendly with the other people that you're doing business with and You never know when you need to make that call. And then if you aren't, just go to open houses and be friendly with people in the high end, in the lower end, because you never know what price point you're going to need. And um, it was a real easy phone call for me because I always remain friendly with my agent community. Anyway, just a quick share on that. We'll see. I'll keep you posted. We'll see if we get it or not. Awesome. I hope you do. How many people show a hand? It's always interesting how good realtors are at using math when it comes to threes. How many people did the math and was like, whoa, she's going to make more than David Pinnell made? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that that should be a nice that's probably well, no i'm not because i would have to split it <laughs> but it's a two and a half percent commission probate. it is on this one yeah that's the agency's the agency's standard yes i just need to move to your market that's it yeah really that's what, what I, I left maui with a me like it's double that now but when i left the medium was 1.35 million and yeah. I come to Roanoke and it was 140,000. And I'm oh. like, I couldn't have just done this in Maui. You know, it's <laughs> always interesting to... to me. Yeah, like really quick. I always talk to people who are like, I sold 200 homes this year. I'm like, I would be retired if I sold 200 homes in a year. <laughs> like, it's not that it's inconceivable. It's just not that likely. So it's the same, same difference. <laughs> anyway, thank you. You know what I found too? I did 127 houses in 2019. You just have to have more help and it's really not worth it. I'll do probably 35 houses this year and I'll make just the same amount of money and I'm not worried about it anymore. I went from 13 in the first four months of residential to 52 in the first 12 months in, in that calendar year. And then I went to 72 and then to 104. I made more money mm-hmm. on 52 transactions than I did on 104. Yeah. Like everybody likes to talk about GCI. That's a BS metric. Show me your net. Tell me what your EBITDA was. And they're like, huh? Um, like your, their profitability just dropped. And that's where you were when we met, David, you had what, six callers in your office and a commercial lease. And and I was bragging about it too. And I was, I was excited about it because that's the coaching I was in. And it's of all- course, if I could build it up again, I just really don't have the energy for it. My CRM does the work for me now and I'll make calls maybe twice a week now, but I got a pipeline of over 600 people in probate. And then the stress, I have 3000 houses. It's just the funnel that you have to build up that y'all have to get on the phones at first, Mm -hmm. but then you start, you start getting, I've got several testimony. I got three that we're working on right now that'll be posted and you just get there. But back to your comment, Chad, I don't want to, I don't want to do a hundred homes in a year again, man. I was working eight days a week. Like it was, there were some days where you'd have seven and eight closings. It was just nuts. We already bought tickets to Hawaii in, in June 15th for two weeks. So that's the new goal. Cool. Yeah. What, which yeah. island are you going to? Just wherever I got a, the main island where the plane lands, I guess. I, but big, I didn't even island. see. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't very... even see. We're just going to figure it out as we go. All right. Yeah. Call me, call me when you, when you land, I'll tell you. What <laughs> I mean, that's the idea now, 60 days out for two weeks. So 
I'm not shameful of it. Plus we're actually, that. you guys, hopefully, not not too far from now. Like, we're actually going to start traveling as a team, like uh, all of us in, in this company. We're going to be going. We're going to try Switzerland maybe first, but actually take the team abroad, work abroad for a month, and then come back home for a couple months and then go back out. Nice. And we're going to see if we can actually build this from other countries around the world where we want to be. So you guys might get some neat scenery here as we as we move toward that. So I'm proud of you, Dave. Like, take, like make those vacations a bigger priority than revenue. That's awesome. You're, you're... But you just you chased the wrong target. And, and I guess having our son was the the difference for me is like man i was working way too, I was, and i wasn't getting ahead man I was, I was spending the money just to make the money back when i first really realized the opportunity in probate it was like eight grand a month i and i'm like how the hell did i get here it was like 99 dollars here 197 yeah, the next thing i know i was at eight grand a month and i figured out probate and i just dropped it all like i just i, I burned it all to the ground <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's all live and learn. Like we all have to figure it out. You don't know what you don't know. Like until you build the big giant mar marketing monstrosity, you don't realize how hard it is to maintain. And until you go work 12, 14 different lead types, you won't realize yeah. that, that probate's the easiest place to make six, seven figures of income if you just focus on one. Like I had to learn it. You had to learn it. Everybody else, hopefully everyone else can learn from our mistakes and not everybody has to repeat it. I went eight months when I started and I was scared to call Yeah. and I re rewrote my script uh, several times, man. It's, it's just have conversations with people. They're yeah. either ready to talk to you. They're not. Yep. Yeah. All right. Jim Lloyd, you're patiently waiting. How can we help you? Thanks. Yeah. New to the community, but really appreciate it and all the content. And just out of curiosity, I wanted to follow up with, the conversation on branding you were having with Mike, we just sent out our first set of letters for probate, but use the broker logo as more recognizable than trying to come up with, we, we started an LLC as well for the investing side, but like there's no brand capital on that. So I was just curious, like what the overall impression is as agents slash investors, if most people tend to utilize, you know, yeah, I saw, I guess, Bill Gross with the EXP there or a Keller Williams or, you know, Colwell Bank. So I started with, I have two, two matching brands. I had an investment brand and a realtor brand. They were both consistent and it was either, hi, I'm Chad, the realtor. I'm Chad. I'm, I'm a local investor, blah, blah, blah. I had the experience of falling on my face several times on the phone and also in appointments, realizing that when I attached that identity myself, it was very hard to be nimble. It was hard to change my identity and not break or pour. What I learned in face-to-face -face appointments ultimately taught me to just remove branding off of everything. So as, as a licensee, what I recommend is your brand is J-I-M. Like that's in the first sentence. Hi, my name's Jim. That's the branding impression. I want you to be Jim, not Jim the realtor, not Jim the investor, not Jim the holding company operator, not Jim the property manager, whatever it is you do, just be Jim in the beginning. Because what we don't want is that association. So David mentioned earlier, like in the URL, how they can associate the negative emotions and probate with a simple URL. The people, he also mentioned all the people that are getting hammered by investors who don't have really anything valuable offer. They're just calling, going right for the jugular. They're not, they're not trying to be empathetic. They're not trying to think about the other person's emotions and navigate that conversation with, you know, tact. They're just trying to get paid. If you call yourself an investor, then you adopt that person's reputation. If the realtors are hammering the phones and trying to say, I got buyers looking, can we come? We need to get in that house. When can I get in the house? Can I come look at it? And they they didn't slow down enough to even say, what's, what's the family's plans for this? Then they're going to shut off when you say, I'm a realtor, because they're going to think, huh, he's a selfish son of a bitch, just like the rest of them. So what I've found to be most effective is just be Jim. And in your letters and in your phone calls, my name's Jim. I've got a team of people put together here locally, specifically families like yours. It usually starts with a simple conversation and then we see what what is the the best service we can provide you're not technically offering brokerage services in that message like in that letter but just to play it safe i go down to the footer of the letter like double click in microsoft word and open the footer editor and then like a number eight light gray font put in whatever the state requires make sure it's legible but put in the minimum requirement for marketing compliance based on real estate law in your state 
And that's all it has to be. It can say ABC real estate brokerage, phone number, address, license number, whatever is required. It needs to be legible, but not prominent. You don't want it to stand out. It's not there for a branding impression. It's there in case you accidentally send a letter to someone who already listed their home and that person reports you to the state or to the board. And then you have to defend yourself. And that's like, oh, by the way, mine even had an asterisk in that footer. It had brokerage name, brokerage phone number, and URL, I think was our minimum. And then asterisk, ethics are of utmost important to us. If your home is already listed or you have an agency relationship with a licensee, please disregard this letter. And that actually, I got a call from my broker one day. She's like, hey, good job on your on your CYA. You pissed off one, one of our peers. You actually sent a letter to a property that was listed, but we're good. I'm just calling to tell you thanks for always covering my assets. And I'm like, perfect. So that's how I did it. Like I would just be Chad until I, until I saw where the conversation was headed. I wouldn't even start to discuss the actual services or the role I was playing or disclose agency or uh, license disclosure. And you'd talk to your broker about when you have to do that. But for me, until I was discussing the house or price or terms of that house, I didn't have to tell them I was a licensed agent. What was the point? Like, I don't, like, I don't, when I go, you know, to the grocery store, I don't have to identify myself to the cashier as a licensed agent if we're not talking about real estate. So a lot of people are scared from their brokers or from real estate school. They think they have to get that out there on the front. And it's just simply not true until you get to a certain point in the conversation where implied agency, even that's a gray area. But my rule of thumb is if the conversation could even be somehow interpreted as implied agency, then I'll disclose there. But normally it doesn't get into that territory until you're almost at the end. You choose a strategy, you, you tell them, hey, listen, I think my best service to you is gonna be as a real estate broker. So what I would suggest is we put it on the market at this price and use this strategy. Here's the blue pen. And it's literally in the last minute that I actually disclose. So if my best advice based on experience and coaching thousands of people through this, like create a specific brand for this purpose or pull back the brand altogether and just be Jim. Great. Yep. Mike, you mean to have your hand back up? Yeah. So I... I'm seeing here in Sacramento, we are starting to get a lot more I notice the defaults going through. I get it. I pull them up through PropStream, but you had mentioned a different service. I would stick with PropStream. They have the best data feed. I, oh, it was in Texas. So in Texas, there's a company called Roddy's. My friend owns it, full disclosure, but they, in the state of Texas, their big data is two weeks late on pre-foreclosure data. So Roddy's has a proprietary process that they get the data two weeks sooner. But like in California, you got, you know, Black Knight, First American, Lexus, Nexus, all those guys are getting those files out of the California cap courthouses. So yours will be, and PropStream has the most, I think they have the highest level of data integrity across their competitors. That's why I recommend them. So what the, the other data points that you're augmenting and sorting your list by, I think you have more accurate data in PropStream. That's why I recommend and one more thing, I know we're getting towards the end here, but you you had clipped guys at PropStream or something like that. Did you have a, so I was just told that they lost their access to MLS data. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, they did. Are they getting that back? I don't think so. No. So I, I don't, I haven't talked to Rob about it specifically. That the, the company was bought by Stuart Title. A lot of data is based on relationships. So when it's in the handoff in a big data trans, you know, big data acquisition, I'm guessing someone lost a relationship there and it, it came apart. I don't know for sure, but I, I wouldn't expect it to come back. Otherwise, they would have found a way to not lose it. Okay, thank you. All right, Terry, you're up again. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I have one more question that has to do with the commercial side of probate. I have some software that will allow me to pull up any five plus in the case of multifamily properties that are in probate all over the country by zip code. Have you or any of the others here had any experience with that, that you could shed some light or directions to me to pursue or not? To no, go get it. Most, most commercial real estate owners don't have a proper succession plan. Most like 95% of small business owners don't have a succession plan. So if like, I would recommend, especially with your experience in the investment arena, like you, you can talk that language. I would say that should be one of your priorities is actually going to those. I built a data augmentation when I was at all the leads, we call it probate plus. And I think they've since changed that and phased it out. But 
I was shocked at how much commercial real estate I was able to find using Probate Plus, which was just a, a match and a pen data augmentation. And we found like eight and ten, eight, nine, ten figure properties, like massive commercial portfolios. And it's not, you haven't had anyone who really, you know, specialized in that and has consistent success stories. What we do have is people uncover them every once in a while. Roger Lisi hasn't been here in a while, but Roger was, he was reluctant. He wouldn't get on the phones when I first met him. And I finally got him juiced up and got him to make prospecting calls. First deal out of the gate was like a $7 million commercial out parcel in the path of progress like in, in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, where Walmart was. And it was a family farm. And they could have sold it for 150 grand, but they called the right guy and he knew what to do with it. And he sold it as a commercial. So we had another one that was, I think it was a $58 million cliffside hotel and in, in somewhere in Northern California. So you'll find hotel real estate portfolios. I found that I can't remember all my exact percentages, but a surprising amount of probates contained more than one piece of real estate. It was not hard to find the portfolios of 10 to 50 homes that was owned by one decedent. Keep in mind for anyone who's calling any probate list, they could own a hundred houses. There are lots and lots of people who own a hundred houses. One of our members, it was last year, I think, she got 14 deals off of one single phone call because the, the family had 13 houses, like the one she went to meet at, 12 rental properties. And then she got the neighbor across the street. She listed and sold 14 houses in one, appoint, one phone call, one appointment, 14 deals. So keep in mind when you're talking to these people, just because they're going through probate doesn't mean they don't have significant assets. A lot of people will form a trust and then not properly fund it. And John Fraker's like, I know that's one of the things that makes him mad. People do what's right for themselves, but then don't finish properly. But a lot of times, like when I was going through all those data samples with Probate Plus, I found people that had established trusts, not properly funded them, and they had dozens and dozens of, of realist properties that had to go through probate because they didn't properly fund the trust. So I think you should absolutely pursue that. Good job. So I can't remember your first name. Young, was it David Young? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Dude. So David, tell everybody what you did. What, what, like that's taking action, brother. Good job. Yeah. I reached out to her. She went ahead and got an attorney. She's going to file the administrator of the state for the uh, pre-foreclosure home. And she'll be getting the papers in the mail next week. So that she'll be able to stop that pre-foreclosure. All right. Now step two is what? I need to ask. Figure out when the last payment was made. You get her to call and get a payoff statement. And, and like, you need to know how much it is to buy the note like to buy her out in case that's an option. And more importantly, how, how far behind are they with penalties and fees and everything? Next week, you're buying a house, man. Yeah, like like she said, she only want five grand. Like I said, I know they owe 100000 on it and the house, the ARV on the property is like 305000 What's the rent? Uh, the rent is uh fifteen, I think 1600 a month. I think you'll be all right, all right. Yeah, the payments, I know the payments on the loan is like $660 for the so here's what I want you to do. I want you to buy it. I want you to put a, a great tenant in place and get it in QuickBooks, get two months of P&Ls and then call me. And actually I, I picked the bank out. If you didn't see it already, I did a, a video for some, one of our members this week and it was in Atlanta. I actually showed them how to pick out the right community bank to do debt service coverage ratio loans in your market. So get two months of rent roll. And on your P&L, take that to a community bank, refinance yourself out and de-risk it, and then put a commercial line of credit against it in addition to that. So you just turn, you turn 10,000 bucks, let's just call it 15,000 bucks. You're going to turn that into a hundred thousand dollars of strike capital as a line of credit. And you can do all this and in, inside of the next 60 days. Yeah. So you're like, literally you can take 10 grand and 10 X that in 60 days, just by thinking creatively. Yeah, because like I said, all, all she wants is five thousand dollars. Because she don't want to deal with the house, she just don't want to just to let it go to the bank without nothing. She says she only want five grand. Yeah, oh, awesome man! Thanks for the update. Go get that one. Okay. All right, Renee, did you mean to have your hand back up? I did, and I don't remember what. Oh, I know what it was. Hold on. Uh, prop stream. So you were saying prop stream. Just wanted to shout out to everybody here. There's another company called Privy, which is also something people might want to take a look at if you don't need all the information from PropStream. It's looking at it now, go, go privynow.com.
And I've been using that too, just a subsidiary. It's a little easier to use. It's more like an MLS, a national MLS than PropStream is so data heavy. I don't know that one. What's the, what's your monthly expense on that one? It's the same. I think it's a hundred bucks, 90, 90s, whatever they make it, $97. And I split it with somebody. He just sells me the money. So if you guys want to do that, you can always hit me up and share the cost. Yeah. Huh. All right. Thanks for that. I actually didn't know there's other, like there's Remind, Propelio, RealFlow, PropStream, and now Privy. So those are all kind of big data real estate platforms. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up for the day. Thanks so much for an engaging call. Dave, good to hear you're making it in this career. I hope you can get your cash flow caught up and it's not such a struggle next quarter. Uh, no, for, for real, man, thanks for sharing both your lifestyle accomplishments and your business accomplishments. Nice to have you here. And uh, everybody, we'll see you around next week or sometime between here and there. Have a great day.